Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> Here we are. We're back. And, All right. And Emma's going to tell us what we're up to. So we are up to the arrival of Parashurama, exchange of hot words between Lakshmana and Parashurama. And Rama, Ram uh, triumphs over the latter. We're going to have a war of words between a couple of peeps before we get to the, the whole wedding and marriage and party. Yep. Cool. Did you want to take it away, Seven Prem? Uh, I can do that. <clears throat> We're up to two six seven. Yep. With fiery eyes and knitted brows, he cast an angry look at the kings, as though at the sight of a herd of wild elephants in rough. A lion's whelp were eager to pounce on them. Seeing the uproar, the women of the city were all distressed and joined in cursing the princes. That very moment arrived the sage, Parasurama, a very, a very son to the lotus-like race of Burugu, led by the news of the breaking of Shiva's bow. At his very sight, the kings all cowered down, even as a quail would shrink beneath the swoop of a hawk. The coat of ashes looked most charming on his fair body. His broad forehead was adorned with Tripundra. <coughs> A, pe a peculiar mark consisting of three horizontal lines sacred to Shiva. <clears throat> Having matted locks on the head, his handsome moonlike face was a bit rendered with anger. With knitted brows and eyes inflamed with passion, his natural look gave one of the impression that he was enraged. He had well-built shoulders like those of a bull and broad chest and long arms. He was adorned with a beautiful sacred thread, rosary and deer skin. With an anchor anchorite's covering about his loins and a pair of quivers fastened by his side, he held a bow and arrow in his hands and an ax upon his mighty shoulder. Though saintly in attire, he had a terrific record of deeds. His persona, therefore, defied description. It looked as if the heroic sentiment had taken the form of a hermit and arrived where the kings had assembled. <clears throat> Beholding the frightful figure, Parasurama, the kings all rose in consternation and mentioned in his own as well as his father's name, each fell prostrate on the ground before him. Even he on whom Parasurama cast a casual look in a natural way, thought the sands of his life had run out. Then came Janaka and bowed his head, and sending for Sita, he made her pay homage to the sage. Her companions rejoiced when Parasurama bestowed his blessing on her. Insensible that they were, took her where the other ladies were. Next came Visvamitra who met him and made the two brothers make obeisance at his lotus feet, saying that they were King Dashratha's sons, Rama and Lakshman by name. Seeing the graceful pair, he blessed them. His eyes were riveted on Sri Rama's incomparable beauty, which would humble the pride of Cupid himself. <clears throat> then he looked around, and though knowing everything, he asked Janaka, like one ignorant. Tell me, what has attracted all this crowd here? And as he spoke thus, wrath took possession of his whole being. Janaka narrated to him the whole event, mentioning what had brought all the kings there. On hearing this reply, Parasurama turned round and looking in the other direction, he glanced at the two broken pieces of the bow lying on the ground. Flying into a rage, he spoke in harsh tones. Tell me, O stupid Janaka, 
Who has broken the bow? Show him at once, or this very day I will overthrow the whole tract of land over which you domain, your domain extends. In his inordinate fear, the king would make no answer, and the wicked kings were glad at heart. Gods, sages, nagas, and the people of the city were all filled with anxiety. Their hearts were much agitated. Sita's mother lamented within herself, saying, Alas, God has undone an accomplished, an accomplished act. When Sita heard of Parasurama's temperament, even half a moment passed to her like a whole lifetime of the universe. When Sri Raghunath saw it, everyone seized with panic and perceived Janaki's anxiety, he interposed. There was neither joy nor sorrow in his heart. My Lord, it must be someone of your servants who has broken the bow of Shiva. What is your command? Why not tell me? At this, the furious sage was all the more incensed and said, A servant is he who does service. Having played the role of an enemy, one should give battle. Listen, O Rama, whoever has broken Shiva's bow is my enemy no less than Sahasrabahu. Let him stand apart, leaving this assembly, or else every one of these kings shall be slain. <clears throat> Hearing the sage's words, Lakshmana smiled and said, mocking Parashrama, the wielder of an axe. I have broken many a small bow in my childhood, but you never grow so indignant. Why should you be so fond of this particular bow? At this, the chief of Rugu's race, Parashrama, burst out in a fury. Someone want to take over? Yep. Seven more. Yep. O young prince, being in the grip of death, you have no control over your speech. Would you compare to a small bow, the mighty bow of Shiva, that is known throughout the world? Said Lakshmana with a smile. Listen, holy sir, to my mind and all bows are... What? Oh, sorry. Listen, holy sir, to my mind all bows are alike. What gain or loss can there be in the breaking of a worn-out bow? Sri Rama mistook it for a new one and... At his very touch, it broke in two. The Lord of Ragus, therefore, was not to blame for it either. Why, then, be angry, reverend sir, for no cause? Casting a glance at his axe, Parashurama replied, O foolish child, have you never heard of my temper? I slay you not because, as I say, you are a child yet. Do not take me for a mere anchorite. Do you not take me for a mere anchorite, O dullard? I have been a celibate from my very boyhood but also an irrescribable one. And I am known throughout the world as a sworn enemy of the Kshatriya race. By the might of my arm, I made the earth kingless and bestowed it the time, I bestowed and bestowed it time after time, upon the brahmanas look at this axe which lopped off the arms of sahasrabahu the thousand armed kartavirya a youthful prince 
Do not bring woe to your parents, O princely lad. My most cruel axe was exterminated, even unborn offspring in the womb. Lakshmana smilingly retorted in a, in a mild tone, Ah, the great sage considers himself an extraordinary warrior. He flaunts his axe before me again and again, as if he would blow away a mountain with a mere puff of breath. Here there is no pumpkin in the bud that would wither away as soon as an index finger is raised against it. I, it was only when I saw you armed with an axe and a bow and arrows that I spoke with some pride. Now that I understand you are a descendant of Bragu and perceive a sacred thread of your person, I suppress my anger and put up with whatever you say. In our family, valour is never shown against gods. The brahmanas, devotees of Sri Hari, and the cow, for by killing any of these we incur sin, while a defeat at their hands will bring disrepute on us. We should throw ourselves at your feet even if you strike us. Every word of yours is and is as incisive as millions of thunderbolts. The bow and arrows and the axe are therefore an unnecessary burden to you. Pardon me, O oh great and illumined hermit, if I have said anything unseemingly at the sight of your weapons. Hearing this, the jewel of Bragu's race furiously rejoined in a deep voice, Listen, O Vishvamitra, this boy is stupid and perverse. He is in the grip of death himself and will bring destruction on his whole family. A dark spot on the moon-like solar race, he is utterly unruly, senseless and reckless. The very next moment he shall find himself in the jaws of death. I proclaim it at the top of my voice, and none should blame me for it. Forbid him if you would save him, telling him of my glory, might and fury, said Lakshmana. <laughs> Holy sir, so long as you live, who else can expatiate on your bright glory? With your own lips you have recounted your exploits in diverse ways more than once. If you are not yet satisfied, tell us something more. Do not undergo a severe trial by putting any restraint upon your anger. You have assumed the role of a hero and are resolute and imperturbable. It is unbecoming of you to pour abuses. Heroes perform valiant deeds in fight, but never indulge in self-advertisement. Finding before them a foe in battle, it is coward. It is cowards who boast of their own glory. You seem to have death at your beck and call, and summon him again and again. 
for my sake. Hearing Lakshmana's harsh words, Parashurama closed his hand upon his terrible axe. After this, the after this, let no one blame me. This sharp-tongued boy deserves his death, and I have spared spared him long on account of his being a child. He is now surely going to die," said Vishvamitra. Pardon his offence, holy men. Take no notice of the merits and demands of a child. Sharp-edged is my axe, while I am pitiless and furious, and he stands before me an offender and an enemy of my guru. Even though he gives a retort, I spare his life solely out of regard for you, O Vishvamitra, or else hacking him to pieces with this cruel axe, I would have easily repaid the debt I have owed to my guru. Just about to start 275. Is that right? Yep, yep. No, you've got a long way to go. That's why I quickly went. Okay. Did you want to take over for a bit, Sir Prem, or OMS? Oh, sorry. Either or. Do you want to have another, another go? Don't know if I can hear. No. Oh, he's on mute. I just realised I was on mute. <laughs> ah, what have you been saying? Oh, okay. He's um, reading the whole time. <laughs> yeah, we're both reading. <laughs> um, no, Emma, you go because you haven't had a go a turn yet. So yeah. Yep. And do you know when he needs help? Yes, I do. Uh, said Gadi's son, Vishvamitra, smiling within himself, everything looks green to the sage, Parashu Rama. It is, however, the steel sword that he is faced with and not the sugar extracted from a sugar cane that one could easily gulp. It is a piety that he does not understand and still persists in his ignorance. Footnote. This has reference to a popular saying, a man who loses his eyesight in the month of Shravana, correspondingly, corresponding roughly to August, when the whole landscape is green, visualises everything as green. Vishramitra thereby suggests that Parashurama was blind so far as the greatness of Sri Rama is concerned and imagined that the latter was as easy to handle as the other Pashtriyas whom he could easily vanquish in battle. Again, there is a pun on the word Kada in that the original, which means both a sword and sugar. Okay, back to the text. Said Lakshmana, is there anyone, O oh good sage, who is not aware of your gentle disposition, so well known throughout the world? You have fully paid the debt you owe to your parents. The only debt which now remains to be paid by you is the one that you owe to your guru. And that has been vexing your mind not a little. All right, footnote. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, did you have a footnote there? Yeah, I don't know if it's best to say footnote in the middle of the sentence or to keep reading to the end of the sentence and then do the footnote because like, I agree. it's really jarring. Yes. Yeah, I agree with you to wait till the end of the sentence. Yeah. yeah. Usually it's not too far from the end. Although... Yeah, but this one's like right in the very middle of a really long sentence. Oh. So, yeah. so you have yeah, fully you have paid. Just... Work it out, yeah. Yeah, work it out quickly. Yeah. So you have fully paid the debt you owe to your parents. So this is the footnote. There is a sarcastic allusion here to two noble, notable incidents in Parashumara's life. We are told in the Puranas how Parashumara, I don't know if I'm saying that right now. Yeah, that's what I've got. I've added an M in there somewhere. Parashurama 
killed his own mother at the bidding of his father, Jamadangi Dagni, Jamadagni, who had got incensed at her returning from the river rather late. Oh, yeah, that's definitely a killable offence. Pleased with his obedience, Jamadangni insisted on his asking for a boon. At this, Parashurama prayed for the restoration of his mother's life and his prayer was immediately granted. His mother was brought to life again and did not even remember the cruel act of her son, luckily. On another occasion, Parashumara, Parashurama's father, Jamadagni, was slain by the followers of King Sahasrabahu in order to avenge themselves of their leader's death at Parashurama's hands and the latter retaliated by extripiating not only the descendants of Sahasra Juna but the whole Kashtriya race gradually. Okay, I have that made sense. Yeah. What did you say? Kshatriya. Kshatriya. I think. Okay. So back to the text. I'll just read that sentence again. You have poorly paid the debt you owe to your parents. The only debt which now remains to be paid by you is the one you owe to your guru, and that has been vexing your mind not a little. It looks as if you had incurred the debt on your, our account. And since a considerable time has now elapsed, a heavy interest has accumulated thereon. Now you get the creditor here, and I will at once repay him from, from my own purse. Hearing these sarcastic remarks, Parashurama grasped his axe and the whole assembly cried, Alack, alack, O chief of Brugus, you are still threatening me with your axe, but I am sparing you only because I hold you to be a Brahman. O enemy of princes, you have never met champions staunch in fight. You have grown important in your own little home. O holy Brahman, Everyone exclaimed, this is wholly undesirable. The Lord of Raghus now beckoned Lakshman to stop. Perceiving the flames of Parashu Rama's passion grow with the pouring of oblation in the form of Lakshman's rejoinder, the son of Raghus race spoke words like water. My Lord, have compassion on a child and wreak not your war wrath on this guileless youngster. Uh, who is the mother's milk still on its lips. If he had any idea of your might, how could he be so foolish as to affront you? If children play some pranks, their teachers and parents are in raptures at it. Therefore, take pity on him, knowing him to be a child and your servant. For you are an even-minded, good-tempered, forbearing and illuminated anchorite. On hearing Sri Rama's words, Parashurama cooled down a little, but uttering something, Lakshmana smiled again. Seeing him smile, Parashurama flushed all over with sage and said, Rama, your brother is too wicked. Though fair of hue, he is black at heart. He has deadly poison and not the mother's milk on his lips. Perverse by nature, he does not take after you, nor does this vile imp regard me as the very image of death. Lakshmana smilingly said, Listen, holy sir, passion is the root of sin. Swayed by it, men perpetrate unseemly acts and indulge in misanthropic activities. Indra, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure, it, did it just say Lakshmana is perverse by nature or something like that? Yep, that's what he said. I'm pretty sure when we're listening this morning, we were listening to the Valmiki one, and well, maybe if it wasn't this morning or yesterday or something, but I heard that talking about Lakshmana, it was gentle by nature. Gentle by nature. Well, or maybe not gentle, I don't know, but like it was just like. The opposite of what I just said, you know, something completely different. Well, this is this is so, Parashurama hurling insults yeah, at Lakshmana. Yeah, yeah. It's probably in different context, the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in this moment, it's in the middle of a 
a heated a extreme. little bit of an argument in luxury yeah, yeah. a little bit of a stir but yeah yeah it's interesting yeah um Yeah, it's really important to check who's talking, hey. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have a and sometimes it can be yeah. hard in the text because, like, it will say Lakshmana said and then it will say what he said rather than having that at the end, which is what we're used to when we read a book. Yeah. You have the text and then said someone. Or they'll say, like, slayer of foes, someone of something, 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 something said ram said and you're like you've already forgotten what's who's the like the, the progress of the conversation yeah. who it's like who's saying what when yeah all right continue As you were. so lakshmana is saying this i am your servant O chief of sages put away your wrath and show mercy upon me Anger will not mend the broken bow. Pray, sit down, your legs must be aching. If you are very fond of it, let us devise some means to mend it by calling in some expert. Janaka has, was frightened at Lakshmana's words and said, Pray be quiet. It is not good to transgress the limits of propriety. The people of the city trembled like aspen leaves. They said to themselves, The younger prince is really very naughty. As the chief of Bragus heard the fearless words of Lakshmana, his whole body burnt with rage and his strength diminished. In a condescending manner, he said to Rama, I'm sparing the boy because I know he is your younger brother. So fair without and foul within, he resembles a jar of gold full of poison. At this, Lakshmana laughed again, but Sri Rama cast an angry look on him. Therefore, putting away all petulance of speech, he submissively went up to his guru. Joining, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but it's sort of good too because it's like, <clears throat> although like in our heads we've always seen Lakshman as like being this loyal uh, sort of um, good person that follows Ram and 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 so forth. It's sort of a good little bit of backstory of like, well, he was still young at that time and they hadn't been through their adventures and things which matured him. And so this is yeah. still him yeah. as, you know, like, yes, he's loyal and all that sort of stuff to his brother, but at the same time, he still has that youthly fire. Yeah. He hasn't, yeah. Because, mm. yeah, because this is before they've even been it, exiled. They've only just broken Shiva's bro, Baru. Yeah. And have they got married? They got married, yeah. Not yet. Oh, no, they're not married yet. Sita and Ram have not got married they're yet. They're about to get married, aren't they? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it is still right in the the prime of their youth before they go off to the forest and all of that yeah. happens. So who's a fiery young thing? Where was I? Okay. Joining both his palms together and speaking in most humble, gentle and placid tones, Sri Rama said, I pray you, my Lord, wise as you are by nature, pay no heed to the words of a child. A wasp and a child have like disposition. Saints never find fault with them. Besides, the boy has done you no harm. It is I, my Lord, who have offended you. Therefore, your reverence... Therefore, your reverence, deal to me as your servant whatever you please, whether it be to favour or frown, death or captivity. Tell me quickly the means, O chief of sages, by which your anger may be appeased. I shall do it accordingly. Said the sage, how can my passion be pacified, O Rama, when your younger brother is still looking mischievously at me? So long as I do not cut his throat with my axe, my wrath is ineffectual. At the very news of the cruel doings of my axe, the consorts of kings miscarry. To think that having the same axe still at my service, I should see this princeling, my enemy, alive. My hand moves not, though passion consumes my breast, while this axe, which has slain kings without number, has gone blunt. Fate has turned against me. That is why I find my nature changed. 
Otherwise, compassion at any time is unknown to my heart. My tenderness of feeling has imposed on me a severe strain today. On hearing this, the son of Sumitra bowed his head and with a smile. The breeze of your benevolence is so befitting your fame. The words you speak appear as though blossoms dropped from a tree. O oh, reverend sir, when compassion sets your whole frame on fire, God help you when you are angry. Look here, Janika, this stupid boy is... This stupid boy in his perversity intends to migrate to the region of death. Why, why not put him out of my sight? Though small to look at, the princeling is yet so wicked. Lakshmana smilingly said to himself, shut your eyes and the whole world will vanish out of your sight. Does anyone want to continue on? Sure. <clears throat> Then Parashurama spoke to Sri Rama, his heart boiling with rage. Having broken Shiva's bow, O wretch, do you now teach me? It is with your conv <clears throat> it is with your connivence, connivence that your brother addresses such pudent words to me. While you make false entries, with folders hands. Either give me satisfaction in combat or forswear your name, Rama. Give battle to me, O enemy of Shiva, without taking recourse to any wily trick, or else I will dispatch you and your brother both. While well, the chief of Brugus thus raged with his ax raised on high, Sri Rama smiled within himself bowing his head to the sage. While the fault is in Lakshman's, the sage's wrath is against me. Sometimes meekness too begets much harm. A crooked man is reverenced by all. A crescent moon is not devoured by the demon Rahu. Said Sri Rama, give up wrath, O Lord of sages. The ax is in your hand, while my head is before you. Do that, my Lord, which may pacify your anger. Know me to be your servant. How can there be any duel between a master and his servant? Give up your anger, O great Brahmana. It is only because he saw you in the outfit of a warrior that the boy said something to you, and he is not to be blamed for it. Seeing you equipped with an ax, arrows and bow, the boy took you for a warrior hero and got excited. Although he knew you by name, he did not recognize you in person and answered you according to his lineage. If you had come as a sage, the child, O oh sir, would have placed the dust of your feet on his head. Forgive the error of one who did not know you. A Brahmana should have plenty of compassion in his heart. <clears throat> what compassion, my lord, can there be between you and me? Tell me if there is any affinity between the head and the feet. Mine is a small name consisting of a single word, Rama, whereas yours is a long one, having the word Parasu prefixed to Rama. <clears throat> whereas my only asset is a bow, you have endowed with nine most sacred qualities, serenity, control of the senses, Austerity, purity, forgiveness, straightforwardness, knowledge, wisdom, and belief in God. <clears throat> I thus stand defeated by you in every way. Therefore, O holy Brahmana, forgive my faults. Uh, those holy qualities are in the Gita, 1842. Again and again did Sri Rama address his namesake as a sage and as a great Brahmana, till Parasurama exclaimed in a fury, you are as perverse as your younger brother. Do you know me to be a mere Brahmana? I tell you what kind of a Brahmana I am. Know that the bow is my sacrificial ladle, the arrow is my ablation and my wrath, the blazing fire. The brilliant fourfold forces consisting of the horse, the elephant, 
the chariots and the foot soldier are the fuel. And the mighty princes have served as victims, whom I have cut to pieces with this very axe and offered as ablation. In this way, I have performed millions of sacrifices in the shape of armed conflicts, accompanied by the muttering of sacred formulas in the shape of war cries. My glory is not known to you. That is why you address me in the contemptuous terms, mistaking me for a mere Brahmana. Since you have broken the bow, your arrogance has gone beyond all limits. In your self-esteem, you stand as if you have conquered the whole world. Said Sri Rama, O sage, give a thought to what you say. Your anger is out of all proportions to my error, which is a trifling one. Worn out as it was, the bow broke at my mere touch. What reason have you to be proud? Hear the truth, O Lord of Bagrus. If, as you say, I treat you with disrespect because of you, because you are a Brahmana, who is that gallant warrior in this world to whom I would bow my head out of fear? A god, a demon, a king of a body of warriors? Whether my equal in strength or more powerful than myself, should any of these challenge me to combat, I would gladly fight with him, no matter if it be death himself. For he who is born as a Kshatriya and is yet afraid of fighting is a veritable wretch and has brought a slur on his lineage. I tell you in my natural way and not by way of tribute to my race, Raghu's descendants are not scared to meet in battle, even death. Such is the glory of the Brahmana race, that he who is afraid of you, Brahmanas, is rid of all fear. When he heard these soft yet profound words of Sri Rama, how Sri Rama's <clears throat> mind was disillusioned. O Rama, take this bow of Rama's lord and draw it so that my doubts may be cleared. Um, good night. Oh, Sharama had got this bow from God Vishnu himself, who had told that when the Lord descended on the earth in the form of Sri Rama, his own life's work would be end, and the bow would pass into the hands of Sri Rama. <clears throat> Back to text. As Parashuramas offered his bow, it passed into Sri Rama's hands on its own, and Parashurama was amazed at this. He then recognized Sri Rama's glory, and his whole frame was thrilled with joy, and his hair stood on end. Folding his hands in salutation, he addressed the following words to Sri Rama, his heart overwhelming with emotion. Glory to Sri Rama, whose delights Ragu's race even as the sun delights a cluster of lotuses. Glory to the one that like a fire consumes the forest of the demon race. <clears throat> Glory to the benefactor of gods, brahmanas and cows. Glory to him who takes away pride, ignorance, passion and delusion. Glory to him, whom is an ocean of humility, amiability, compassion, and goodness, and a past master in the art of speech. Glory to the delighter of his servants and to him who is graceful of every limb and whose form possesses the beauty of millions of cupids. <clears throat> How can I with one tongue expatiate on your glories? Glory to him who sports in the mind of the great Lord Shiva as a swan in the Manasaravara lake. In my ignorance, I have said much that was unseemly. Therefore, pardon me, both the brothers, embodiments of forgiveness that you are. <clears throat> glory, glory, all the glory to the chief of Ragu's race. So saying, Hoshirama, the lord of Ragus, withdrew to the forest to practice penance. The wicked kings were all seized with their own imaginary fears, and the cowards quietly fled in all directions. The gods beat their kettle drums and rained down flowers on the Lord. 
All the people of the city rejoiced in their heart's agony. Born of ignorance was gone. There was a tumultuous playing of the bands and everyone displayed charming and auspicious objects. Troops of fair-faced, bright-eyed damsels sang melodious song in chorus, their voice resembling the sweet notes of the cuckoo. Janica's joy was beyond description, was that of a born beggar who has found a treasure. Sita was rid of her fears and was as glad as the young of a kokora bird at the rising of the moon. Janaka made obeisance to Vishnamitra and said, it is due to your grace, my Lord, that Sri Rama has been able to break the bow. The two brothers have accomplished my purpose. Pray tell me, revered sir, what is to be done now? Said the sage, listen, wise king. The marriage depended on the bow and took place directly the moment the bow was broken, as is well known to all, including gods, human beings, and nagas. <clears throat> Nevertheless. Never okay. Yep. Did you hear it? No. Oh. Do it, like, you, you did it all the way over there. I thought it was thinking you should. Sound it here? Can you hear it? No. Oh, it's cutting it out. Oh, oh no, that means that means on our other podcast, everyone's just like, what are they talking about? <laughs> But on YouTube, it might have worked. It depends. Yeah, it would depend on whose microphone. Oh, yeah, because we checked that it worked, Correct, didn't we? Yeah. yeah, and it sounded awesome. <clears throat> Probably because my microphone was on, I couldn't hear it. Ah. Uh, you know, like it cuts in and out depending on who it is. Yeah. Ah. Uh, uh. So you can hear it when we're talking. Blah, 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 ding, blah, 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 ding, blah, blah, blah. No, I can't hear anything. Oh. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> you just heard me say blah, 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 though. I don't understand what's happening there. It may also be because I'm partially deaf. I might be, not be able to hear that. Oh, well, I've just been going for it. Well, playing around with the settings last time, maybe I should have had another look at it. Yeah, sorry. Was I just reading and reading and you guys were trying to get my attention? I only felt like a second. <laughs> you for a second. <laughs> Two, eight, six. Like, yeah. Every now and again, I look up and I see you doing something. I'm like, oh, no, they're not following me. It's fine. They're just talking about themselves. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> do, do you want to take a quick break? Yeah, do you want to take a quick break, press pause? Yeah, let's take a quick break because we're we'll, we'll up to the next section. So, and it. Yeah. So, yeah. what do I do? Do I hit something? Just up at the top. Push the button. Up here, it appears when you. Always stopping the good. <laughs> Just had a really interesting <laughs> conversation. It wasn't recorded. <laughs> 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 Do you want to read? Hmm. Oh, do you want to explain where we're up to? Didn't you say that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't that all the digging and stuff that I missed? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> next, the next section is Janaka's dispatching of messengers to Ayodhya and departure of the marriage procession from Ayodhya. So we're all getting ready for a wedding. Wedding, wedding. Did you want to stop this bit here? Um, yeah, I'm going to stop sitting closer. What's that? Skip into the church. Um, so, where am I up to? 286. Cool. Oh. I want to see you keep You're right. <laughs> but while I'm reading, sure. <laughs> Just move that way, just a tiny. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> I'm gonna just, um, <laughs> um, nevertheless, you now go and perform according to the family usage, whatever practices are prescribed in the Vedas. After consulting the Brahmanas, the elders of your family, and your own preceptor, Satananda. Go and dispatch to the city of Ayodhya messengers who may invite King Dasharatha and bring him here. Janaka gladly responded, Very well, gracious sir. 
and summoning the messengers dispatched them. What's happening? Everyone walking off. Everyone's walking off from me. <laughs> you just move past. <laughs> oh, <dude. laughs> uh, Sorry, just just sorting out parenting things. It's fine, man. It's all. <laughs> um, I just lost my spot there. Uh, Jonathan glad to respond. Very well, gracious sir. In summoning the messengers, dispatched them at that very moment. He then summoned the leading citizens and they all came and respectfully bowed their head. Decorate the bazaars, streets, houses, temples and the whole city on all its four sides was the royal command. They returned in joy each to his own house. Excuse me. The king then sent for his own servants and instructed them, erect pavilions of all kinds with due care. Bowing to the king's orders, they returned glad of heart and sent for a number of clever artisans skilled in erecting pavilions. Invoking Brahma, they set to work and made pillars of a gold pillars of gold in the shape of plantain trees. With leaves and fruits of emeralds and blossoms of rubies. Seeing this most marvelous specimen of art, the creator himself was lost in bewilderment. The bamboo sticks were made of emeralds. They were so straight and knotted that they could not be distinguished from real ones. Creepers known by the name of Piper Beetle, the leaves of which are chewed in India with a red nut pairings were artistically fashioned in gold and looked so charming with their leaves that they could not be marked as artificial. These creepers were intertwined into so many cords for holding the bamboos together with beautiful strings of pearls inserted here and there. After much cutting, carving, and inlaying, they made lotuses of rubies, emeralds, diamonds, and turquoises. They also fashioned bees and birds of a ver a varied plumage, which buzzed and whistled in the wrestling breeze. On the pillars, they sculptured images of God, all standing with articles of good omen in their hands. Squares were drawn on the floor in various naturally charming devices and filled in with elephant pearls. They made most lovely mango leaves of graven sapphires with blossoms <clears throat> of gold and bunches of emerald fruits glistening on silken cords. They further made charming and excellent festoons which looked like so many nooses prepared as it were by Cupid. They also put up many auspicious vases as well as beautiful flags and banners, curtains and chowries. The marvellous pavilion with a number of beautiful lamps consisting of brilliant gems, was beyond description. 
What a poet has the wit wherewith to describe the pavilion which is going to shelter Videha's daughter's daughter as a bride. They the canopy which is going to hold Sri Rama, the ocean of beauty and perfection, as the bridegroom, must be the glory of all the three worlds. The splendour that belonged to King Janaka's palace was to be seen in every house of that city. You can leave the door open, sorry. You okay? To him who beheld Tirahuta, Janaka's capital, during that time all 14 spheres appeared of small account. Footnote on spheres. According to Hindu scriptures, the universe is divided into 14 spheres, seven higher and seven lower. Um... In the ascending order, the seven higher spheres are named as Buh, Buha, Ha, Ha, Maha, Jana, Papa, and Satyam, while the lower seven in the descending order named as Atala, Pitala, Sutala, Natalatala, Talatala, Mahatala, Rasatala, and Patatala. Patala. <laughs> okay, now say it fast. Back to the text. The prosperity that reigned in the house of the humblest citizen was enough to fascinate even the Lord of Celestials. The magnificence of the city wherein dwelt goddess Lakshmi in the charming disguise of a mortal woman made even Sharada the goddess of eloquence and 1,000 tongue Shesha falter in describing it. It's a lot of tongues, thousand. Janaka's messengers arrived at Sri Rama's sacred birthplace and rejoiced to behold the charming city. They sent in word at the entrance of the royal palace. Hearing of their arrival, King Dasharatha summoned them to his presence. With due reverence, they delivered the letter, and the king in his joy rose to receive it in person. As he read the letter, tears rushed to his eyes, and the hair on his body stood erect with his heart, and his heart was full. With Rama and Lakshmana in his heart, and the valuable letter in his hand, he remained mute and could not utter a word, either good or bad. Then recovering himself, he read out the letter, and the court rejoiced to hear the authentic news. Obtaining the news at the very spot where he had been playing about, Bharata came with his playmates and brother Satrugna, Satrugna, and with the most, with the utmost modesty and affection, asked, "Father, where has the letter come from? Are my two beloved brothers doing?" well and in what land do they happen to be on hearing these words steeped in love the king read the letter over again 
On hearing the letter, the two brothers experienced a thrill of joy. Their whole frame was bursting with an excess of emotion. While, oh, sorry, the whole court was particularly delighted to see Bharata's unalloyed love. The king then seated the messengers close by him and spoke to them in sweet, sweet and winning tones. Tell me, friends, who are these? Are these two boys well? Have you seen them well with your own eyes? The one dark and the other fair of hue. They are equipped with bow and quiver and are of tender age and accompanied by the sage Kakushika, Koshika. Uh, do you recognize them? If so, tell me something about their temperament. Overwhelmed with love, the king asked thus and and again, the ask thus again and again. From the day the sage took them away, it is only today that I have obtained authentic news about them. Tell me how King Videha was able to know them. At these fond words, the messengers smile. Listen, O crest jewel of kings, there is no one so blessed as you who have for your sons Rama and Lakshmana. The two ornaments of the universe. No inquiry is needed in respect of your sons who are lions among men and the light of the universe and before whose renown and glory the moon looks dim and the sun appears cool. About them, my lord, you ask how they came to be recognised. Does one take a lamp in one's hand to see the sun? On the occasion of Sita's self-election of her husband, had assembled numerous princes, each one of whom was greater, was a greater champion than the rest. But not one of them could stir Shambo's bow, and all the mighty heroes failed. The might of all those who were proud of their valour in the three... Wells was crushed by it. Even the demon Barna, who could lift Mount Meru, lost heart and retired after pacing around the bow. And even he, Ravana, who had lifted up Mount Kailasa, the abode of Shiva, in mere sport was worst was did in that assembly. On that occasion, we submit, O great king, Sri Rama's, the jewel of Raghu's race, snapped the bow without the least exertion, even as an elephant would break the stalk of a lotus. Hearing the news of the chief of Burgos came in a fury and indulged in much browbeating. But seeing Sri Rama's strength, he handed his bow to the latter and after much supplication withdrew to the woods. Even as Rama, O king, is unequaled in strength, Lakshmana, too, is a mine of glory. 
at whose very sight the kings trembled as elephants at the gaze of a young lion. Now that we have seen your two sons, my lord, no one catches our eye any longer. The messenger's eloquent speech, which was full of love, glorifying and expressing expressive of the heroic sentiment, attracted all. The king and his whole court were overwhelmed with emotion and began to offer lavish gifts to the messengers. They, however, closed their ears in protest, crying, This is unfair. Everyone was delighted to note their sense of propriety. Footnote. In India, not only the blood relations, but even the servants and co-villagers of a bride consider it sinful to accept even food or water, must let sh must much less any gift or present from the house of the bridegroom. For it is customary in this country to give the hand of a girl as a sacred gift and one is naturally reluctant to accept anything in return from him who from him on whom a gift is made this kind of sentiment prevails even in those cases where a marriage alliance has only been stipulated and not yet brought into actually effect, actual effect. The messengers in the above context are actuated with similar sentiment in refusing the gifts offered to them by King Dasharatha, who happened to be the father of the champion who had won the hand of Princess Janaki, their master's daughter. Um, back to the text. The king then rose, going up to Vasishta, gave the letter and... Sorry, gave the letter to him and sending for the messengers with due courtesy related the whole story to his preceptor. The guru was highly pleased to hear the news and said, to a virtuous man, the world abounds in happiness as rivers run into the sea, although the latter has no craving for them. So joy and prosperity come unasked and of their own accord to a pious soul. Just as you are given to the service of your preceptor, the brahmanas as, and cows, as well as of gods, Queen Kosalya is no less devout than you. A pious soul like you there has never been, nor is, nor shall be in this world, who can be more blessed than you, O king, who have a son like Rama, and whose four worthy children are all valiant, submissive, true to their vow of piety, and oceans of goodness. You are blessed indeed for all time, Therefore, prepare the marriage procession to the sound of kettle drums. How does someone else feel like? Go on. Uh, I don't mind. We're going in rounds and it's up to you, Emma. Otherwise, Who's up next? I don't know. Emma? Yeah. At the top of this page. 
and proceed quickly. On hearing these words of the preceptor, the king bowed his head and said, very well, my lord. And after assigning lodgings to the messengers, returned to his palace. The king then called all the ladies of the gynecium to read about Janica's letter to them. All rejoiced to hear the message and the king himself related the other tidings which he had heard from the lips of the messengers. Bursting with emotions, the queen shone like pea hens, rejoicing at the rumbling of clouds. The preceptor's wife and the wives of the other elders in, the joy, in their joy invoked the blessings of heaven and the mothers of their four brothers were overwhelmed with ecstasy. They took their most beloved letter from each other and pressing it to their bosom, cooled their burning heart. The great king recounted again and again the glory and exploits of both Rama and Lakshmana, saying that it was all due to the sage's grace he went out of doors. The queens then sent for the brahmanas and joyfully bestowed gifts on them, and the brahmanas returned to their home uttering blessings. Next they called the beggars and lavished innumerable kinds of gifts on them. Long lived the four sons of the emperor Dasharatha. i do that again. I always do the th rather than the t. Anyway. Mm. Uh, mm. Or th as I like to do it. Thus, no, just kidding. Thus, thus Tay shouted as Tay left. Thus they shouted as they left, attired in raiment of various kinds. There was a jubilant and tempestuous clash of kettle drums. When the news spread among the people, festivities were started in every house. All the 14 spheres were filled with joy at the news of the forthcoming wedding of Janaka's daughter and the hero of Ragu's race. The citizens were enraptured to hear the glad tidings and began to decorate the streets, houses and lanes and lanes. Although the city of Ayodhya was ever charming, being the blessed and sacred abode of Sri Rama, it was adorned with beautiful festival, festival decorations because of the love the people bore towards the very embodiment of love. Flags and banners, curtains and graceful showeries canopied the bazaars in the most marvellous fashion. With vases of gold, festal arches, festoons of netted gems, turmeric, blades of durva glass, grass, curds, unbroken rice, and wreaths of flowers. The people decorated their respective houses, which were already full of blessings. The lanes were sprinkled over with water, mixed with the fourfold pastes of sandal, saffron, musk, and camphor, and the squares in front of their houses were filled with the taste with tasteful designs. We're getting into it. Collected here and there, troops of ladies, all brilliant as the lightning, with moon-like faces and eyes resembling those of a fawn, and beauty enough to rub Rob Love's concert Rati of her pride, and who had practiced all the 16 kinds of female adornment sang auspicious strains with voices so melodious that the female cuckoo was put to shame on hearing the sweet sound. So there's a footnote about the 16 kinds of female adornment. According to the standard works of poetics, the 16 forms of female adornment are as follows. One, rubbing and cleansing the body with fragrant unguents. Two, ablation. No, that's wrong. Ablation, ablation. Three, putting on new attire. Part four, dyeing the sides of one's feet with red lag. Five, dressing the hair. Six, adorning the parting line of the hair with red lead. That's not a good idea. Seven, painting the forehead with streaks of sandal paste. Eight, dotting the chin with a small black spot. Nine, colouring the palms of one hand, one's hands and the soles of one's feet with a reddish dye extracted from the leaf of the Mahadi plant. Ten, and inting one's body with perfume. Ten. Of, hmm? I 
anointing. Oh, well, this is in ting. What? Oh. I would have gone with uh, anointing. Wait, show me. And ting. It's probably just a typo. <laughs> I think it might be a typo. This <laughs> is <laughs> two words. It's and and then in ting. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just missing a zero where there's a space. Is it? Yeah, it's missing. Oh, sorry, I just said O. Oh, yeah. Not they put zero. a space rather than a no. Someone hit the space bar at the wrong time. Because I would have thought it was anointing one's body with perfume unguents. 11, adorning the body with bejeweled ornaments. 12, beautifying the hair ex with reefs or flowers, for example. 13, Perfuming and dyeing one's mouth with chewing by chewing beetle leaves. Fourteen, coloring the teeth. Wow, this is a lot of work. Fifteen, painting the lips, and sixteen, applying florium to one's eyes. I'm surprised they ever left the house with that amount of work. All right, where did we get to? How is the king's palace to be described? We're back to the text. The pavilion set up there would dazzle the whole universe. Various articles of good omen and charming in appearance were displayed and a number of kettle drums were sounded. Here were panegyrists singing the family glory and here were Brahmanas chanting the Vedas. While pretty women carolled festive songs, many times repeating the names of Rama and Sita. There was an excess of joy all round. While the palace was too small to contain it, it seemed, therefore, as if it overflowed on all sides. What poet can describe the splendour of Dasharata, Dasharata's palace in which Rama, the crest jewel of all divinities, had taken birth? The king next called Baharat and said, go and prepare the horses, elephants and chariots and start at once in procession for Rama's marriage. The two brothers were thrilled to hear this command. Baharat has sent for the officers in charge of the stables and issued necessary instructions. The latter rose in joy and hastened to execute the orders. They equipped the horses with gorgeous saddles Gallant steeds of different colours stood there in their majesty. They were all beautiful and surpassingly swift-footed. They trod the ground as lightly as though it were red-hot iron. They belonged to different breeds, which were more than one could tell. They would fly in the air, as it were, outstripping the wind itself. Gallant princes who were of the same age as Braharat mounted them. The princes were all handsome and adorned with jewels and had a bow and arrow in their hands and all well-equipped quiver fastened at their side. They were elegant, blithesome youths, chosen and skilled warriors all, and with each knight were two footmen, clever at sword play. The champions, who were all staunch in fight and had taken a vow of chivalry, sailed forth and halted outside the city. The clever fellows put their steeds through various paces and rejoiced to hear the clash of tabor and drum. The charioteer, charioteers made their cars equally gorgeous with flags and banners, gems and ornaments. They were also provided with elegant, elegant chowries and tinkling bells that outdid in splendour the chariot of the sun god. The king owned numberless horses of with dark ears which the charioteers yoked to their chariots so just a footnote on the horses with dark ears they are a rare and invaluable breed of horses milk white all over and dark only in the ears which were considered specially suitable for a horse sacrifice Ugh. okay four horses don't have black ears all right back to the text they were all beautiful and looked so charming with their ornaments that even sages would be enraptured at the sight. They skimmed the surface of water even as dry land and would not sink even hoof deep, so marvellous was their speed. Having provided the chariots with missiles and weapons and every other equipment, the charioteers called their masters. Mounting the chariots, the processionists began to collect outside the city. On whatever errand one went, each was greeted by auspicious omens. 
On magnificent elephants were mounted splendid seats with canopies wrought in a manner beyond all description. Elephants in rut adorned with clanging bells, headed like beautiful rumbling clouds in the rainy month of Sravana, roughly corresponding to August. There were various kinds of other vehicles, such as charming palaquins, sedans, etc., on which rode companies of noble brahmanas. Incarnations, as it were, of all the hymns of the Vedas. Genealogists, bards, panagrists, and raposodists, too, rode on vehicles appropriate to their respective rank, while mules, camels, and oxen of various breeds carried on their backs commodities of innumerable kinds. Millions of porters marched with burdens slung across their shoulders. Who could enumerate the various the varieties of goods that they carried. Crowds of servants also proceeded on the journey, equipping themselves in their own way and forming batches of their own. Each had boundless joy in his heart and a thrill ran through the bodies of all. They whispered to one another, when shall we feast our eyes on the two heroes, Rama and Lakshmana? The elephants trumpeted their bells clanged with a terrific din. On all sides there was a creaking of wheels and a neighing of horses. The clash of kettle drums would drown the peal of thunder. No one could hear one's own words, much less of others. At the entrance of the king's palace there was such an enormous crowd that a stone thrown there would be trodden into dust. Women viewed the sight from housetops, carrying festal lights in salvers, used on auspicious occasions, and caroled melodies, caroled melodies, melodious strains of various kinds in an ecstasy of joy beyond description. Then Sumantra, King Dasharatha's own charioteer and trusted counsellor, got ready a pair of chariots and yoked them with steeds that would outrun even the horses of the sun god and brought them in all of their splendour before the king. There was their beauty was more than the goddess Sharada could describe. One of them was equipped with the royal paraphernalia, while the other was a mass of splendor and shone brightly. Does anyone want to keep reading? I don't know where he's gone. Did you want to go on? <laughs> yep. This magnificent chariot the king joyfully caused Thasista <clears throat> to mount and then himself ascended the other, remembering Lord Shiva, his preceptor, Thasista, Thasista, goddess Guri or Parvati, and god Ganesha. <clears throat> In the company of Thasista, the king shone forth as Indra, the lord of celestials, by the side of his preceptor, Prasparti. After performing all the rites sanctioned by family usage or prescribed by the Vedas <clears throat> and seeing everyone fully equipped for the journey. Remembering Sri Rama and after receiving the permission of his preceptor, he sailed forth to the blowing on the conch shell. The immortals rejoiced to see the marriage procession and rain down flowers full of auspicious blessings. <clears throat> There was a confused din of horses neighing, elephants trumpeting and playing of music, both in the heavens and in the procession. Human and celestial dames alike sang festal melodies, while the clarionets were played in sweet accord. There was an indescribable clamour of bells, both large and small. The footmen leaped and danced, displaying exercise of various kinds. Jesters proficient in peasantry and expert in singing melodious songs practice all kinds of buffoonery. <clears throat> Gallant princes made their steeds covet to the measured beat of tabors and kettle drums. Accomplished dancers noted with surprise that they never made a step out of time. The splendor of marriage procession was more than one could describe. <clears throat> Fair and auspicious omens occurred. 
the blue neck jay picked up food and the left and heralded the blue neck jay picked up food on the left and heralded as it were all good fortune <clears throat> on, a lux <clears throat> on a luxuriant field on the right became visible a crow and a mongoose was seen by all a soft cool fragrant breeze was blowing in favorable direction blessed Suhan, Suhagina, women, ladies whose husbands are living. Unwidowed, it says here. Say that again. It says unwidowed here. Ah, okay. That is a better description then. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the unwidowed women appeared with filled up pitchers and babies in their arms. A fox turned round and showed itself again. Again and again, and a cow suckled its calf in front of the procession. A herd of deer came round to the right, as if good omens appeared in visible form. A Brahmani kite promised great blessings, and a Shama bird was observed on the auspicious tree to the left. A man bearing curds and fish, and two learned Brahmanas, each with a book in his hand, came from the opposite direction. <clears throat> All kinds of blessed and auspicious omens and those conductive to desired results occurred all at once as if to prove themselves to be true. Auspicious omens easily occur to him who is God in a manifested form as his own son. In the marriage which was going to take place, the bridegroom <clears throat> was no other than Sri Rama and Sita herself was the bride. By the pious Dasharatha, 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 Dasharatha. I like I like Dash. I'm just calling King Dash. <laughs> uh, Dasharatha and Janaka were the parents of the bridegroom and the bride, respectively. <clears throat> Hearing of the marriage, all good omens danced in merriment and said. It is now that the Creator has proved us to be true. In this way, the procession set forth amidst the neighing of horses, trumpeting of elephants, and beating of kettle drums. Learning that the chief, <clears throat> learning that the chief of the solar race, King Dasharata, was already on the way, King Janaka had the rivers bridged and got beautiful rest houses erected in different stages which vied in magnificent, magnificence, magnificence <laughs> with the city of immortals, Amaravati, and in which members of the bridegroom's party were supplied with the excellent food, beds and clothing, each according to his own taste. Finding never new pleasures agreeable to themselves, all the members of the marriage party forgot their own homes. Ding! Ding! <clears throat> <laughs> so the next session believe it or not I, I know this is going to be shocking to everyone is the arrival of the marriage procession and its reception <laughs> that's the next section um are we reading on through that yep <clears throat> here you go Unless you don't want to. <clears throat> no, it's fine. <clears throat> when it was learned that the marriage procession was approaching and the tempestuous beat of kettle drums was heard, an advance welcome party went out to receive it with elephants, chariots, footmen, and horses duly equipped. Jars of gold full of sweet and cold drinks and trays of salvers and beautiful dishes of various kinds laden with confections of indescribable varieties, delicious as ambrosia, <clears throat> with luscious fruit and many other delightful articles, were sent as an offering by King Janaka with pleasure. The king also sent ornaments, <laughs> wearing apparel, valuable gems of all varieties, birds, antelopes, horses, elephants, and vehicles of every description. 
charming aromatic substances of an auspicious nature and various articles of good omen. And a train of porters marched with their loads of curds, parched rice, and presents of endless variety slung across their shoulders. When the contingent of welcomers saw the marriage procession, their mind was filled with rapture and a thrill ran through their bodies. Seeing the welcomers equipped in every way, the members of the marriage party had their drums beaten in great delight. A batch from each side joyfully marched at a gallop in order to meet the other, and the two parties met as two oceans of bliss that had, that had transgressed their bounds. Celestial damsels rained down flowers and sang, while the joyous gods beat kettle drums. The members of the welcomers contingent placed all the offerings before King, before King Dasharata and entreated him with an affectionate address. The king lovingly accepted everything and distributed the offerings as presents among his own people or bestowed them as arms on the supplicants. Suppliants. After due homage, reverence and courtesy, the welcomers contingent conducted the marriage party to the lodgings set apart for them. Gorgeous carpets were spread for the royal guests to walk upon, on seeing which Kubera, the god of wealth, was no longer proud of his own wealth. Magnificent were the quarters assigned to the bridegroom's party, which provided every kind of comfort to each guest. When Sita learned that the marriage party had arrived in the city, she manifested her glory to some extent. By her very thought, she summoned all the city's super sensuous powers personified and deputed them to wait on the king. Here in Sita's command, the cities repaired to the guests' apartments, taking with them all kinds of riches comforts as well as enjoyments and luxuries of heaven. Each member of the bridegroom's party found in his apartment all the enjoyments of heaven ready at hand in every way. Sounds good. <laughs> no one, however, had an inkling of the mystery behind the magnificent splendor, all glorified junk. Sri Raghunath alone recognized Sita's magnificence and was glad at heart to discern her love. When the two brothers heard of their father's arrival, they could not contain themselves with joy. <clears throat> but they were too modest to speak to their guru, though their heart longed to see their father. Vishwamitra felt much gratified at heart to perceive their great humility. In his joy, he pressed the two brothers to his bosom, a thrill ran through his body, while his eyes were moist with tears. They proceeded to the guest's apartments, where King Dasharata was staying, as though a lake sought to visit a thirsty soul. When the king, Dasharata, saw the sage come in with the two princes, he rose in joy and proceeded to meet them like a man who feels his footing in the ocean of bliss. The king prostrated himself before the sage, placing the dust of the latter's feet on his head again and again. Vishwamitra pressed the king to his bosom, blessed him and inquired after his welfare. When King Dasharata saw the two brothers prostrating themselves, he could not contain himself with joy. Pressing the boys to his bosom, he allied their unbearable pangs of separation and looked like a dead restored to life. Sri Rama and Lakshmana then bowed their head at Vashistha's feet and the great sage embraced them in an ecstasy of love. The two brothers next bowed before all the Brahmanas and in turn received their cherished blessings. 
Bharata and his younger brother, Satrugana, greeted Sri Rama. He's lifted them and embraced them. Lakshmana rejoiced to see the two brothers, Bharata and Satrugana. And as he embraced them, his limbs were throbbing with emotion. The most gracious and unassuming Lord Sri Rama greeted everyone, including the citizens, attendants, kingsmen, seekers, ministers, and friends in a befitting manner. <clears throat> the sight of Sri Rama was so soothing to the marriage party from Ayodhya. The ways of love are beyond description. By the side of the king, his four sons looked like embodiments, as it were, of the four ends of human endeavor, riches, religious merit, etc. <clears throat> People of the city were delighted beyond measure to see, ah. king, to see King Desharata with his sons. The gods rained down flowers and beat their drums. The nymphs of heaven danced and sang. Sachananda, King Janaka's family preceptor, and the other brahmanas and ministers of state, as well as all the genealogists, minstrels, jesters, rhapsodists, who formed the contingent of welcomers, paid due respects and honor to the king and his party and return taking leave of them. The marriage party had arrived earlier than the day fixed for the wedding. There was great rejoicing in the city on this account. Everyone enjoyed transcendent bliss and prayed to the creator that the days and nights might be lengthened. Rama and Sita are the perfection of beauty and the two kings Dasharatha and Janaka are the perfection of virtue. Thus observe the men and women of the city wherever they happen to meet. Janaki is the manifestation of Janaka's piety, Punya. And Sri Rama is Dashat, <clears throat> excuse me, and Sri Rama is Dasharatha's virtue personified. No one has worshipped Shiva with such devotion as these two kings. Nor has anyone obtained such bountiful rewards as they have. No one has equaled them in this world, nor is there anyone to equal them anywhere, nor shall there be. We are all repositories of all kinds of merits in that we have been born in this world as residents of Janaka's capital. Who is so highly blessed as we who have beheld the beauty of Janaki and Sri Rama? And we will witness Sri Rama's wedding and shall thereby richly reap the benefit of our eyes. Damsels with voice as sweet as the notes of the cuckoo whispered to one another. O bright-eyed friends, we shall gain much by this union. By our great good luck, providence has ordained things well. The two brothers shall often be the delight of our eyes. Time and again, out of affection, Janaka will send for Sita from Ayodhya, and the two brothers, charming as millions of cupids put together, will come to take her back. There will be hospitality of every kind. Who, dear one, would not love such in-laws? On every such occasion, all the people of the city will be happy to behold Sri Rama and Lakshmana. <clears throat> King Dushata, my friends, has brought with him two other lads, exactly resembling the pair of Sri Rama and Lakshmana. One dark, the other fair, both charming of every limb. So declare all those who have seen them. Said another, I saw them today. It appeared to me as though the creator had fashioned them with his own hands. Rata is an excellent copy of Sri Rama. No man or woman can distinguish them at first sight. Lakshmana and Satragana are indistinguishable from, from each other, peerless in every limb, from head to foot. Four brothers attract the mind that cannot be described in words, for they have no match in all the three worlds. Says Tulsidasa, 
They have no comparison anywhere. So declare the poets and the wise men. Occasions of strength, modesty, learning, amiability and beauty. They are their own compeers. All the women of the city made entreaties to the creator. May all the four brothers be married in this city. And may we sing charming nuptial songs. Said so the damsels to one another with tears in their eyes and the hair on their body standing erect. Friends, Shiva, the slayer of the demon Tripura, will accomplish everything. The two kings are such boundless oceans of piety. In this way they all prayed and in their greater and still greater enthusiasm filled their hearts with the bliss of happiness. The princes who had come as Sita's suitors to rejoice, too rejoiced to see the four brothers. And they returned to their respective homes, extolling Sri Rama's all pure and magnificent glory. Thus a few days passed to the delight of the citizens and all the members of the marriage party. At length, the blessed day of the wedding arrived. It was the delightful month of Magashirsh, Mag, Mergashirsha. Say that? Mergashirsha. Mergashirsha. Yeah. <clears throat> and the beginnings of the cold season. Having carefully examined and determined the propitious nature of the planet's date, asterism, and conjunction of the stars, the day of the week and the hour of the wedding. Brahma, the creator, sent the note concerning the hour of the wedding through Narada. It was just the same that Janaka's astrologies had already calculated. When all the people heard of this, they observed, the astrologers of this place are so many Brahmas, as, is, as it were. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got to take a drink. I'm getting a dry mouth. <clears throat> Did you want me to read or it's just having a bite? You can go on. You can go out if you want to. It's fine. Let's go. Um, Here it is. I'm going to be 12. It's like we have a just finish. Um. The most auspicious and sacred hour before sunset, which is the time when cows generally return home from pasture and is consequently marked by clouds of dust raised by their hoofs, arrived. Perceiving propitious omens, the Brahmanas apprised King Videha of its approach. The king... The king asked the family priest, Shatananda, what is the cause of delay now? Shatananda then summoned the ministers, who came equipped with all auspicious articles. A number of conscious drums equipped with all auspicious articles. A num oh, hang on, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yep, uh... A number of conches, drums, and tabors sounded. Festal vases and articles of good men, good omen, such as curds, turmeric, and blades of durva grass were displayed. Graceful women whose husbands were alive sang songs and holy. Brahmanas murmured Vedic texts. In this manner, they proceeded to invite the bridegroom's party with due honour and called at the latter's long longings. When they witnessed King Dasharatha's glory, Indra, the lord of celestials, looked very small to them. The hour... Uh, uh, 
has come. Be good enough to start now, they submitted. At this, the drums gave a thundering beat. After consulting his preceptor and going through the family rites, King Dasharatha sallied forth with a host of sages and holy men. Witnessing King Dasharatha's good fortune and glory and believing their births as fruitless, Brahma and the other gods began to extol him with a thousand tongues. The gods perceived that it was a fit occasion for happy rejoicings. Hence they rained down flowers and beat their drums. Shiva, Brahma and hosts of other gods mounted aerial cars in several groups. Their frames thrilling over with emotion and their hearts overflowing with joy, they proceeded to witness Sri Rama's wedding. The gods felt so enraptured to see Janaka's capital that their own realms appeared to them as of small account. They gazed with amazement at the wonderful pavilion and all the different works of art which were of a transcendental character. The people of the city, both men and women, were so many minds of beauty, well-formed, pious, amiable and wise. In their presence, all the gods and goddesses appeared like stars in a moonlit night. The creator, Brahma, was astounded above all, for nowhere did he find his own handiwork. Shiva admonished all the gods, saying, Be not lost in wonder, calmly ponder in your heart, that it is the wedding of Sita and the hero of Ragu's race. At the very mention of whose name all evil is uprooted and the four ends of human existence are brought within one's grasp, such are Sita and Rama, said the destroyer of Cupid, Shankara. In this way, Shambho admonished the divinities, and then spurred on his noble bull. The gods beheld Dasharatha marching to Janaka's palace. With his heart full of rapture and the hair on his body standing erect, the assemblage of... Oh, I was thinking it would look awesome if he had really long hair. And it's just like, anyway. I'm working on it. <laughs> yes. There's, there's this massive mohawk going on. Uh, uh, Sorry. No, I did have it in there. The, of holy men. the assemblage of holy men and brahmanas accompanying the king appeared like joys incarnate ministering to him. By his Side shone forth the four handsome princes, incarnations, as it were, of the four types of final beatitude. Footnote. The four types of final beatitude, as enumerated in the scriptures, are as follows. One, Salokya, residence in the same heaven as the supreme deity. Two, saru, Sarupya, attaining the form similar to that of the deity. Three, Samipya, living in close proximity with the deity. And four, Sayujya, 
complete absorption into the deity. Back to the text. The gods were greatly inspired with love to see two lovely pairs, one possessing a hue of emeralds and the other of golden hue. They were particularly delighted at heart to see Rama, and extolling the king, they rained down flowers on him. As Uma, the slayer of the demon Tripura, gazed, sorry, as Uma and the slayer of the, the demon Tripura gazed again and again at Sri Rama's charming beauty from head to foot, the hair on their body stood erect and their eyes were bedewed with tears. If there's a no, that's piety and Shiva. Yes. <clears throat> His swarthy form. Did I say that right? Swarthy. That's right. Swarthy. 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 Isn't, it, isn't it swarthy? Swarthy. swarthy. Oh, I don't know. Swarthy. I, it's just because, I it's swarthy. because it's got the th, and we're swapping so much between the Sanskrit and all. Oh, you know, the different ways of saying it. It's, yeah. I love, Emma, the uh, last time Emma was having a go at me because I was saying the Swati. Yeah, but it was <laughs> the other one was the when they were running hither, tither. Yeah. It, 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 <laughs> and I just, <laughs> yep. Anyway. I know it is hard going through all these different languages. Well, yeah, because and before, like, you were saying the word... Uh, something and it was the C in the word and it was a word that we all know in English but you were struggling with it because like yeah we're going backwards and forwards between the there's a million different ways of saying C <laughs> ch, k, whatever um, it just gets confusing yeah oh yeah and in, in that word it was meant to have a S sound like because you know, we often say when there's a C we often say S but yeah, yeah, it's. I just, don't remember what the word was, but I remember what you said. Like, yeah, I, remember what you said. I get it. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Swathy, swathy form. <laughs> swathy. All three. <laughs> I just have a different way of saying it. I guess it's because I've never heard the word in English, <laughs> so I was like, ah. All right. His swati form possessed the glow of a peacock's neck, while his bright yellow raiment outshone the lightning. Wedding ornaments of every kind, all auspicious and graceful in every way, adorned his person. His countenance was as delightful as the moon in a cloudless autumnal night, while his <clears throat> while his eyes put to shame a blooming pair of lotuses. The elegance of his form was transcendental in all its details. Though captivating the soul, it defied description. Beside him shone forth his lovely brothers, who rode curveting their restive steed. The other princes too delayed the pace of their horses, and the family bards recited the glories of their line. Even the bird, even the king of birds, Garuda. Blushed for the sh for shame to note the speed of the steed that Rama bestrode. It was charming beyond description in every way. It seemed as though Cupid himself had taken the form of horse. 
It seemed as if Cupid himself had appeared with all his charm in the disguise of a horse for the sake of Sri Rama and fascinated the whole universe with its youth and vigour, form and virtues as well as with its pace. A bejeweled saddle, thick set with beautiful pearls, gems and rubies shone on his back. The exquisite band with small tinkling bells and the lovely riddle dazed gods, men and sages alike. I'm just going to interrupt again. Yeah. <clears throat> Have you... <clears throat> um, you know, throughout the past chapter, there's been a lot about Cupid. Yeah. From that, like I, in my mind, Cupid is a Roman slash Greek. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. Did you? Did you? Have you guys looked up to see how this translates in the Hindu pantheon? Like, yeah, there is. Well, I thought Cupid was is Roman, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, and so that's why I was wondering. Like, is I, it? Yeah, I, I, or is there? Is there no word maybe that translates so they use Cupid? Um, that's I'm um, uh, I'm very <clears throat> yeah. I thought the same thing too because there's no um because in the the text there's no Cupid mentioned like yeah up here it doesn't say Cupid so it must be a translation thing. Yeah, if we're trying to add. Because yes, they do say. Is it mentioned? I just mentioned at the end. I think I might. Have, I think I might have got it. Um, I think it might be Beshu. Mm. Because in the paragraph before, it finishes with Baji Beshu Janu Kama Banava. What did you just say? Baji Beshu Janu Kama Banava. Oh, Kama. Yeah. Okay. Kama. Kama. So Kama, Kama, oh, Deva, oh. Kama Deva, uh, yeah, and it's got it on here. Uh, as well. Not Kama. Kama Deva and Manmatha are the Hindu god of love, desire, and pleasure. Yeah, Kama. Well, they've used a different name in the next paragraph because it doesn't say Kama again. Because it said, it seems as if Cupid himself appeared in the chat room. And there's no comma. That's why I was I was guessing Beshu because that's in both. Well, I've googled it, and Kama or Kama Deva is that what you just said? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. You're saying. yeah. Is the love god of love in Hinduism? He has many similarities with Greek god Eros and Roman god Cupid. So. Oh, there you go. But um. Cupid, yeah, Kama Deva. Yeah. So every that, everything I look at says that one. Everyone I look at says Kama Deva. Yeah. Not to be mistaken with Karma or Karma. <laughs> yeah, Karma. So many types. Oh Kramer. <laughs> Seinfeld. Easily. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, sorry to interrupt, but I just ah, yeah, 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 yeah no, we, it's really we've interesting had this stuff. Con we've had this conversation, oh, really? yeah, yeah, a long time ago when uh, Shiva killed C Cupid. Right. Um, there's a section in the book when Shiva kills Cupid, but remember he shot him with the arrows. C Cupid shot him with the arrows, and Shiva was not impressed. Um, and so we just evaporate. <laughs> Spontaneous combustion. <laughs> Um, and I had that the thought that thought is like I didn't realize that Cupid was in the realm of Hindu gods, but obviously but he's they've not. Trans they've translated. They translated. It. It's interesting, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, which is yeah, <clears throat> where nothing else seems to be like. It's a really good pickup, man. Like because all the other gods they've left as they haven't put in the the Roman counterparts. I, maybe I don't know. Is that because like the god Shiva 
there isn't a Roman counterpart? I don't know anything about the Romans. Like because because the Rama, Vishnu, and Shiva are the tried Deva and they're mm. so closely interconnected and they flow between each other. I don't know the the Roman gods are very separate. I don't think they flow quite like that. Mm. Mm. So there might not be a like an equivalent to Shiva in the Roman god list. Don't know. Well, I guess the question is why haven't they just said karma? Yeah. And I very much doubt <clears throat> that you could use Google Translate for this. It's probably not one of those languages that are yeah. in Google Translate either. Right. Because my um because it's an ancient language. Okay, here we go. Much stronger. Um because my my instinct now tells me, now that we've kind of worked that out, just to say karma. Yeah. When we see Cupid. Yeah. <clears throat> so um <clears throat> let's uh, I'm gonna we, we, so this is can I read, I read <laughs> which one did you which one did you <laughs> yeah up and <laughs> dear brother I have made you a man who lives in, in the, the world, world. up and by and it doesn't know yeah. the rest. Yeah. It's because of all the characters that it doesn't know what the um so I need the first bit somehow. Well, I've just translated it from Hindi, but that's not the correct language. Yeah, well, what, did, what did you type in? Uh, which paragraph did you copy? This one. It Freedom. seemed as if Cupid himself had appeared with all his charms. Blah, 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 yeah, blah. just that one we're up to, it seemed. Mm. Right, that does not work. Mm. Oh. Yeah. What, what do what do you reckon we do? Do we say karma? I'm a well, bit I'm a bit concerned because it doesn't say it in that in that paragraph. That's what I was gonna say. I'm a bit hesitant to say that as well because yeah. I don't want to be mistaken. I mean I think that's what it is, but yeah. No, no, like from your research that we did, it it is that. And there's so many, like, as we've seen, there's so many typos and what so, like I don't think we're down the um I think it's fine to just um uh trust ourselves a bit, do you know what I mean? Yeah, mine's not translating into anything. <laughs> yeah. oh, no. I'll keep going. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> Might have to end soon, though. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, two. Um, Three, 321 is when it changes. Okay. So oh, yeah, I was now. after this one, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Oh, so read to 321. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Hanging out for a read? Yeah. Yeah, I don't mind. Yeah. Okay, go. Oh, because I don't know how long is that. So it's a fair while, so mm -hmm. I'll go for a little bit. Well, if it's too long, we can wrap it up in a minute. No, no, we we read them pretty quickly. It's three twenty one. Yeah. 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 Marching with he with its mind completely merged with the Lord's will, the horse looked most beautiful as though a cloud irradiated by stars and the fitful lightning had mounted a peacock and made it dance. Yep. <laughs> Even Sharada is unable to <laughs> describe the noble steed on which... Sri Rama Road, Shankara, who's who has five faces with three eyes, 
H was enamored of Sri Rama's beauty, beauty and congratulated himself on his possessing as many as 15 eyes. When Sri Hari Vishnu fondly gazed on Rama, both Rama and her Lord were equally enchanted. The four-faced Rama too was delighted to behold Sri Rama's beauty, but he felt sorry to think that he had only eight eyes. The gener generalissimo <laughs> of, of the <laughs> heavenly host. This must be a word they pulled out of somewhere. Sometimes the words they choose are very odd. Gen like, generalissimo. Generalissimo. Yeah. That sounds like an Italian. Because hmm. um, I think because they're not native English speakers, some of the words yeah. they choose are quite yeah. Google Translate. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Um. Oh, just mute it. Just I don't know what to do. This one. Okay, great. Oh, I think they have. Anyway, oh. I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, generalissimo. Oh, the generalissimo oh. of the heavenly host, the six-faced Kartikeya, exulted over the fact of his possessing half as many eyes again as Brahma. When the wise lord of celestials gazed on Sri Rama with his thousand eyes, he thought Gautama's curse as the greatest blessing. All the gods envied Indra and observed no one can vie with Purandara Indra today. The whole host of heavenly beings rejoiced to behold Sri Rama, and there was joy beyond measure in the court of both the monarchs. There was great rejoicing in the court of both the kings, and a tempestuous clash of kettle drums on both sides. The gods rained down flowers, shouting in their joy, glory, glory, glory to the jewel of Raghu's race. In this way, when it was known that the marriage procession was approaching, all sorts of music began to play, while Queen Suna, Sun, Sunayana, Sita's mother, summoned married women whose husbands were alive and prepared with their help auspicious materials for the ceremony of waving lights round the bridegroom. Someone else want to? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I always forget. Mm -hmm. All right. Kindling lights of various kinds and collecting all other articles of good omen, a bevy of graceful women who possessed the charming gait of an elephant proceeded joyfully to put, don't ever say I've got a charming gait like an elephant, it's not, proceeded joyfully to <laughs> perform the ceremony of waving lights round the bridegroom. They all had moon-like faces and eyes like those of a gazelle. By the elegance of their form, they robbed Rati, love, not consort, this, uh, not Cupid this time. He, they've used love's consort rather than Cupid's consort. Mm. Mm. Robbed Rati of all self-conceit. Attired in costly garments of various colours, they had adorned their person with all kinds of ornaments. They had further beautified all their limbs with auspicious materials and sang melodies that put to shame even a female cuckoo. Bracelets, small bells around their waistbands, as well as anklets made a jingling sound as they moved, and even love's elephants blushed for the shame to see their gait. 
all kinds of music played and there were rejoicing both in the heavens and in the city. Mm, here we go. Shachi? Is that, would that be a ch? Sorry. Indra's consort, Sharada, Rama, Bhavani and other goddesses who were pure-hearted and clever by nature assumed the disguise of lovely women and joined the royal gynaceum. They sung festal songs in a melodious voice, and as everyone was overcome with joy, no one could recognise them. Who should recognise whom when everyone in the giant gynoceum proceeded in the, her ecstatic joy to join in the ceremony of waving lights round the bridegroom? Who was no other than the supreme spirit incarnate? Melodious songs were being sung and kettle drums gently sounded. The gods rained down flowers and everything looked most charming. All the women who all the women were delighted at heart to behold the bridegroom, who was the fountain of joy. Tears of love rushed to their lotus-like eyes, and the hair on their pretty limbs stood erect. The joy which Sita's mother felt in her heart on beholding Sri Rama in the attire of a bridegroom was more than a thousand Sharadas and Shashas could not tell in a hundred kalpas. Restraining her tears out of regard for the auspicious occasion, because we learnt last time that it's um, bad luck, inauspicious for women to cry at auspicious mm. moments. Mm. So restraining her tears out of regard for the auspicious occasion, Queen Sanyayana performed the ceremony of waving lights with a glad and heart, and duly completed all the rites prescribed by the Vedas as well as by family usage. The five kinds of music were being played, accompanied by five varieties of other sounds and festival songs, carpets of different sorts were spread on the way. So just a footnote about the five kinds of music. The five kinds of music referred to above are those produced from Vinna, or the lute, the clapping of hands, the clashing of a pair of cymbals, the beating of a kettle drum, and five, the blowing of a trumpet or any other wind instrument. There's also a note about the five varieties of other sounds. The five varieties of other sounds are one, the davani, the murmuring of Vedic texts, Vardiv, okay, Vandindavani, the praises sung by family bards, Jaya Devani, shouts of victory, Shankar Devani, the blast of conscience, and five, Dandubin Devani, I don't know if I said all of those right, beat of drums. After waving lights, the queen offered, back to the text, after waving lights, the queen offered water to Sri Rama for washing his hands with, and the latter then proceeded to the pavilion. Dasharata shone in all his glory with his followers. His magnificent put, magnificence put to shame the guardians of the different worlds. From time to time, the gods rained down flowers and the Brahmanas recited proprietary texts appropriate to the occasion. There was such a great uproar in the heavens as well as in the city that no one could hear one's own words, much less of others. In this way, Sri Rama entered the pavilion. After offering him water to wash his hands with, he was conducted to his seat. When Rama was installed on the seat reserved for him, lights were waved round him and everyone rejoiced to behold the bridegroom, scattering about him gems and remnants and ornaments of, in profusion, while women sang festal songs. Brahma and the other great gods witnessed the spectacle disguised as Brahmanas, and as they gazed on the beauty of Sri Rama, who delighted Raghu's race even as the sun brings joys to the lotuses, they regarded this privilege as the fulfilment of their life. Wow. Having gathered the offerings scattered about Sri Rama, the barbers, torchbearers, family bards and dancers bowed their head and gladly invoked blessings on him with a heart overflowing with joy. 
having observed every custom and derived its authority from the Vedas or from popular tradition, the two kings, Janaka and Dasharata, embraced each other with great love. The two monarchs, while embracing each other, presented a glorious spectacle. Poets made repeated efforts to find a suitable analogy, <laughs> but felt abashed at their failure. Finding no comparison anywhere, they felt baffled and concluded that the pair could be likened to themselves alone. The gods were enraptured to see the tie of love between the two kings united by marriage alliance. Raining down flowers, they began to sing their glories of both. Ever since Brahma created the world, we have witnessed and heard of many a marriage, but it is only today that we have seen the pomp and grandeur on both sides so well balanced in every respect and the fathers of the bride and the bridegroom so well matched. Hearing the above voice from heaven, which was so charming yet so true, there was a flood of transcendent love on both sides. Unrolling beautiful carpets on the way and offering water to wash his hands with, Janaka himself conducted das Dasharata to the pavilion with all honour. The marvellous art of the pavilion and its charms captivated the heart even of the sages. Yet wise Janaka fetched the palace, uh, fetched and placed with his own hands thrones for all the honoured guests. He worshipped the sage Vashishta as if he were his own family deity and supplicating before him received his blessings. While the supreme devotion with which he paid his homage to Kaushika was something too great for words. King Janaka gladly adored Bama, Bamaidev, another family preceptor of King Dasharata, and other rishis as well. He gave them all gorgeous seats and received blessings from all of them in return. Again, he paid divine honours to the king of Ayodhya, taking him to be the peer of Shiva and none other, and mentioning how his fortune and rank had been enhanced through the relationship with King Dara Dasharata. He made humble supplication to the latter and extolled him with joined palms. King Janaka worshipped all the members of the bridegroom's party with the same honour in every respect as he paid to the bridegroom's father and assigned appropriate seats to them all. How am I to describe with one tongue the warmth of his feeling? Janaka honoured the whole bridegroom's party with gifts, polite behaviour, supplication and sweet words. Brahma, Hari, Hara, the guardians of the eight quarters of the world and the sun god, all of whom had knowledge of Sri Rama's glory, disguised themselves as normal Brahmanas and witnessed the spectacle with great delight. So there's just a footnote on the eight quarters of the world. So the guardians of the eight quarters of the world are Indra, the lord of celestials of the east, two, Agni, fire god of the southeast, three, Yama, the god dispensing the fruit of one's good or evil actions of the south, four, Nuti, the god of death of the southwest, five, Varuna, the god of water of the west, six, Vayu, the wind god of the northwest, seven, Kuvera, the god of riches of the north, and number eight, Ishana, Shiva of the northeast. Back to the text. Janaka worshipped them as on par with gods, and though he recognised them not, assigned them exalted seats. Who should recognise and whom should one know when everyone had forgotten one's own self? As they gazed on the bridegroom who was bliss personified, joy was diffused on both sides, in the bridegroom's party as well as in the court of Janaka. The all-wise Rama recognised the gods, worshipped them mentally and assigned them seats of his own fancy. And the immortals were delighted at heart to perceive the congenial manners and gentle disposition of the Lord. Ding! So we're up to section number 321. And this is the wedding of Sita and Ram. And then their farewell. So 
next section will be the actual wedding. We've got the whole, everyone's arrived, everyone's seated, we're ready to go. There you go. <clears throat> I find it interesting sometimes how different our translations can be. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like even, even little things like <clears throat> um, the previous uh, Doha 320, I think it was. <clears throat> uh, it must have been further back. I can't remember now. <clears throat> but yeah, anyway, that was quite different. Oh, yeah. Um, at the bottom of that, you had you had, you know, his worshiping sage, uh, Vasista, Vasista, as his very his own family, blah blah blah. Which one is this? Three, three twenty or three? Yeah, three twenty, I think. Oh, my sister, is it? Or actually, it might be 3.19.4. Yeah, 3.19.4. 3.19 is here. Okay. And then we're in this paragraph here somewhere. Yeah, down the bottom of that. I was talking about... Unrolled the beautiful carpets. Uh, the mother's marriage, charm, captivated heart, sages, wise, Janica, fetched place for dinners. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah we yeah, found, yeah. found it. Yeah, so in that you had, <clears throat> he worships sage, Basista. Yeah. Then it goes on a little bit. Yeah. Well, a supreme devotion with he paid homage to, and you had some other name. Yes, Kaushika. Right, and mine says Vishvamitra. Yes, yeah. Oh, yes, I've noticed that ours does that. Yeah. So it uses and, uh, and which, Oh. Mm. Yeah, and which, like, we know, like, a lot of the gods and things have different names, so. But that's I've, a good one. That's another good one that you picked up because I didn't know that they were the same. Well, I only know that <laughs> because every time he says Fish from Itra, and this one pops up. I'm like, oh, they're the same person. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I read had, it. I had, yeah, yeah, I just. Yeah. I also find it really interesting that every time, like, your text mentions Rama, it's always Sri Rama, but ours is sometimes just Rama without the Sri. Yeah, right. Like, it's. They've my, taken... book, my book's more respectful than yours. <laughs> yeah. Yours is more devotional. <laughs> Um, ours, ours had a word limit. And the other thing I noticed too is yours always talks about like waving of lights instead of saying Aki. Ah, uh, you know? yeah. Or even you don't, you mustn't even have that in brackets, I assume. No, we don't. No, it's just waving of lights. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Little things, but it's interesting those different translations and, you know, what's. Yeah. 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 Translates better and what doesn't, and so forth. And sometimes <clears throat> it's sort of been good having two translations because, like, like the Cupid thing, it's like, oh, hold on, like, let's read into that and see what the actual meaning of this is. You know, yeah. Well, in like, in, like a when you have, when, in in any sort of paragraph, when you have the two translations and they're quite different. And you talk about them, you can actually find the meaning of the paragraph. Whereas yeah. if you just have the one version, then you're just subject to, oh, well, that's what it must mean. <clears throat> sort of thing. Yeah. And it's it's interesting because obviously between the two versions, someone's gone through and gone, oh no, that's a better word. And it's like, it's yeah. not always, I don't think it's always the case, but yeah, but somebody went through and said, oh, I think this is a better English word for it. Mm. Yeah. But not always. No. <laughs> like, yeah, I was thinking the other day, it amazes me, like, like language, It we don't, we don't really think about it every day, but, like, language changes so fast. Mm. Like, totally. throughout history, like, 
so it's it's quite amazing that like these stories still like get through do you mean like that no one's translated rama do you know like ram and sita and like that they that those names just they they last the span of time do you know what I mean like it's quite an incredible thing because yeah like our language is just changing in our in our short lifetimes that we've had so far like it's changing it's changed a lot and, very rapidly yeah and just to think the 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 length of time that these names have lasted it's amazing yeah yeah definitely that's awesome um shall we stop recording yes yeah let's do it yes yeah yeah